Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tosh Talks. Obviously, I'm Tosh and I'm talking. Welcome. It's, uh, it's a very sunny day and um, I want to talk about something that's kind of gloomy on a Sunday day, which is London. Which is actually a lie. Not that I'm talking about London, but I have been to London numerous times. And I've been there when it's not foggy, but sunny. So that foggy London thing, I think it's sort of a myth, at least it's to me. But London, one of my favorite cities, if not my favorite city, it's actually the most city that I'm obsessed with for some odd reason. Um, and the place I do go back to occasionally is because, it's not because I love it, but because I love the culture of London. It's not the city itself, but it's really the culture that came out of London. And for the last 20 years, I've been obsessed with London of, say, from 40, 1947 to like 1969. Uh, f f of course, due to the Fab Four, meaning the Beatles, uh, introduced me to London culture. Or if actually the Beatles introduced me to foreign culture. I knew nothing about American uh, anything outside of America when I was a child except for the Beatles and, and London. Not even England, London. London represent the whole foreign world to me at one time as a child. And um, so I got into um, English literature or London literature like Colin Wilson whose book The Outsiders and a lot of uh, novels by Patrick Hamilton whose work deals with sort of um, um, the years of London during the bombings and how people were affected by the bombings and how they continue their social life in such an environment. And from there I got into the music more. Besides the Beatles, I discovered people like Billy Fury, Tommy Still, um, um, uh, Anthony Newley, and, um, um, and these are the figures that represent to me, oh the Shadows and Cliff Richard of course, and these are people who represent London to me another side of London, actually a more darker, more interesting side of London than, say, the Beatles era and afterwards. So, obviously, this will lead me to the visual arts of London of that time, and um, I became not, definitely not specialized, but I became deeply interested in painters of London from like the 40s to like the 70s to the pop art era of the late 60s and 70s and so forth. David Hockney was an introduction to that world for me. And um, slowly, very slowly, I got into more into the world, the painting world of, uh, of London. Um, I only knew a few artists, Francis Bacon and Freud. And that's about it. And Kitai sort of knew, because of his association with David Hockney. And Kitai lived in Los Angeles for a while, as well as uh, David Hockney. But um, last week I went to a show at the Getty Center, and I saw a show called London Calling. And it's artists featuring Bacon, Freud, Kossoff, Andrews, Auerbach, and Kitai. Six painters. And it's a fascinating show for many, many, many reasons. First, I'm going to criticize something. Um, the title, London Calling, is totally wrong. And the gift shop before you enter the gallery is totally wrong. Well, not totally, because they have some good stuff. But the bad thing is they were selling like a Sex Pistols CD and a Clash CD. And I'm, if, I remember, if my memory serves me correctly, English Beat. And obviously, that music does not cover or represent London culture of the 50s and 40s and, and very, very early 60s. And I have to presume two things about the title London Calling. Uh, if you're from my generation, you'll also think of the Clash song and album London Calling, which is totally wrong. It doesn't represent that era at all. Or it, the, the term London Calling is from This Is London Calling, which is the announcements during the World War II from the BBC, like This Is London Calling, and then they give a report of the current bombing. So that's, it makes more sense in the context of the show, but even that is too restrictive and not, not right. 
It should have been called, the show, the exhibit should have been called like um, Fish, Chips, and Champagne. That would have been a more proper title for this show. So, there's that. Um, and I don't want to criticize it too much because I'm just very thankful for a show like this being in Los Angeles and for free, mind you. Well, $10 parking, but it's basically free. And um, so London Calling, the show, is, is six artists, six painters, but it, it's a very small show. It's not a, huge, it's not a huge show at all. And most of the paintings came from the Tate collection, Tate Gallery collection out of, uh, out of London. So it's more like a survey and a very, very, um, a very sort of um, loose survey. It's not, I mean, it, it spans for great, you know, all, all these six artists lived for a long time. Some are still alive, the ones who passed away died in their 70s, 80s. They had long lives and did a lot of work. And you're not seeing all that work, obviously. It's just, so you're just getting a glimpse, a little introduction, a survey. And, um, and again, the only person, the superstars, I guess, would be Freud and, and Bacon in this show for the average American um, um, art person or viewer, if I, if I can use the word average. And um, what struck me was discovering something new in this exhibit. And the person I discovered knew that really, really turned me on was an artist by the name of Michael Andrews. And Michael Andrews he passed away in the 90s. He was born in like 1927, something like that. Um, he was a friend of, uh, of all these artists, specifically Freud and Bacon, as well as David Hockney. And um, his works are, you know, when you first go in the gallery, that's the first work you see, the first paintings you see. And Michael Andrews is, um, well, one thing, okay, the, all the British artists in the show have two things go, going at least. One, they either take their images from photographs and then do a painting from those photographs. Uh, Francis Bacon does that. Uh, Auerbach doesn't do that, sorry. Uh, Francis Bacon and Michael Andrews take from photographs. And I believe at first Kitai did that later uh, uh, insisted on working with live models. And, um, uh, and um, it's such a difference when you're using or painting from, from a photographic image than a real life image. And even though all these people are painters, you still can see the difference between getting that image from a photographic image than, say, a, li a real life image, like a model in front of you. You can't sort of hide the fact that you have a model in front of you for some reason in a painting. It, that you can't lie about that for some reason. I'm not sure why, but you just, you know, you just pick up on it that these, whatever they're painting is actually something in front of them, and, or it's a photograph, and you can tell the difference. So Bacon obviously uses a series of photographs, almost like a collage effect in his paintings. And um, what's interesting about Francis Bacon is the way he presents his subject matter. You know, the subject matter is usually very English. All, 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 every painter's subject matter is something English or London-like. But it's very, very, um, uh, for Bacon, it's very theatrical. When you look at his paintings, it's like looking at a theater piece. It's like the figures are on a stage or in a contained room of some sort. And you can see the boundaries in the Bacon where like, you just sort of focus, like space here, but then you look at the center of the painting and that's like the stage and where the figure, the sort of twisted dark figure is, in, in, is the center of the painting. So there's something very theatrical about Francis Bacon compared to Freud, who basically just do, does still life paintings of models like on his bed in his studio. Um, both painters are very confined in their areas where they work in. You know, um, uh, Bacon doesn't go somewhere else to do his paintings, neither does Freud. They work in their studio, which is really obvious when you see their paintings. Freud more so, because Freud doesn't do landscape painting. He does mostly portrait paintings, or paintings of nudes on his bed, or paintings of his wife holding a cat like this. Strangling the cat, mind you. Doesn't look, looks, looks like a sweet painting of a woman holding a cat, but there's something kind of sinister about this painting. It's that, that subtle textuality that's interesting. So Freud focuses on the studio. You know it's in the studio. It's a very self-contained world. 
and same with Bacon, which is actually looks like a real stage, like a theatrical stage or a cinema. In fact, in fact, of all the artists, I find Bacon the most cinematic of them all. And painters like uh, um, uh, Auerbach and Kossoff are very similar because they do use live models on a consistent basis. And also, they're very, very focused on like this two or three things. They use the same model over and over and over again. And I know Auerbach only paints around his neighborhood that he lived in in London. So what you get is basically um, uh, images of the same street, like Oxford Street, for instance, over and over and over again. And when you first look at some of, his, of, of, of both Auerbach's and Kossoff's paintings, it looks abstract. Like you can't, like you just, it just sees like this abstract painting in front of you. But like within like, you know, like 10 or 12, 20 seconds when you're looking at this painting, also you start seeing figures coming out, you know. Um, um, Kossoff has a painting of a called Man in a Wheelchair. Uh, when you first look at it, it's totally abstract, but then you see the man in the wheelchair. It's just sort of emerging from this sort of like miles of tons of paint on this canvas. And Auerbach does the same technique. In fact, Auerbach and Kossoff were very close friends. So obviously um, they shared information or they shared a sensibility. And again, both artists work a world that's very much well contained in their in their in their environment, and they didn't go they didn't go beyond their environment. Uh, my new discovery, Michael Andrews, did go other places. He went to Australia, he went uh, traveled around around England, but mostly he stayed in London. And um, he's interesting to me because he also painted party scenes. He he painted like. Um, his friends, which is like Bacon, uh, Freud, et cetera, et cetera, and these great, great, great paintings of, uh, uh, of, of taking place in a party, which are not happy to me. They're kind of sinister. There's a sinister overtones. I'm not sure due to like a drug alcohol thing or some psychological aspect to it, but they're, they're very dark paintings in a very sort of disturbing way. And it's kind of interesting how he sort of paints the face where it's kind of abstract, yet the body or the background, especially the architectural of the buildings or structure, is very, uh, not only painterly, of course, but also very illustrated-like. It's very clear, almost like architectural drawings. But yet there's a sort of abstract uh, figures in front of this abstraction you know, background. And I find that tension really, for Andrews, I find it totally fascinating. And I love that tension between the abstract and and having something like sort of illustrated in the background, like a landscape that's perfectly mapped out. And there's something psychologically going, you know, uh, involved. And um, as I mentioned, Andrews works from photographs as well. He doesn't do the work from still lifes. So it's, it's interesting to me how he, he, he takes these images like Bacon, twists them around, almost like a collage effect. There's sort of different types of painting and one painting is for him and Bacon. And uh, there's some incredible works. And Kitai uh, is an interesting painter. He's almost like a pop artist painter. And, and, and sometimes, for me, I'm very much reminded of early David Hockney's uh, paintings because uh, they're very colorful. They kind of border on sort of, you know, pop art, British pop art. So it's, it's but the interesting about Kitai is he's this sort of a restless figure, I presume. Um, he, he, he's American came to uh, Europe due to the war. I think he was a soldier, stayed in Europe for, um, after the war, mostly located in London, uh, had a life in Kitai, painted, made friends in, uh, in London. Um, then he got married, his wife, some of his wives passed away. He moved back, he moved to Los Angeles, taught at USC for a while, and um, uh, I think he stopped doing paintings, and then he, I think eventually he went back to London, came back to Los Angeles. So his work is very, very, um, each stage in his life, his work is very, very different. Uh, Auerbach and Bacon um, and Kossoff work do not really change that much, or Freud work does not change, in my opinion, greatly. It's all sort of the same work they've done before, but they're not making it better, just giving you another version of that work. And I find that totally fascinating. So, um, the great thing, London Calling is up now, I think, till like December. If, you can, if you're in Los Angeles, you definitely should see it. It's a very small show, but 
what's even more important, I feel, is getting the catalog, London Calling, which is, uh, you, can, you can buy it right now only at the Getty um, Center, but it will be available, after the show, be available at all the bookshops. And um, it's just a fascinating catalog about these artists. And again, I never heard of Michael Andrews, though maybe you may know of him, but uh, there's no actual whole book on him, so, um, or catalog on his work, as far as I know. So it's definitely worth seeing his work in person, but also getting this book to get more into the work of Michael Andrews. And um, um, it's just another, you know, it's just another layer of London world, the London life. And this being London is not enough. These artists are individuals. There are, there are six individual artists. And you have to be careful when you say something like London artists, because their works are quite different, though their techniques are very similar. But psychologically, they work on different points of view and different attitudes. So this is Tosh Talks. There'll be more shows, I think, and I will talk to you later. See you later.